conversation for Ivana. Then he thinks, because he has this view of a permanent self, when he hears the Buddha teaching about giving up the view of self, cessation, or dispassion, cessation, nibbana, he confuses that for the teaching of annihilation. He thinks, I have a self, and if I achieve enlightenment, that means my self is going to be annihilated. So he thinks, alas, I shall be annihilated, I shall perish, and this I, this self of mine, will cease to exist. And so he sorrows, grieves, laments, weeps, and becomes confused. Okay, then in the next case, the Buddha takes the instance of somebody who is without agitation about what is non-existent internally. So here somebody doesn't have this view of an eternal self, so he hears the Tathagata, or the disciple of the Tathagata, teaching the Dhamma for the elimination of all standpoints and so on, and he doesn't think, I shall be annihilated, I shall perish, I shall exist no more, and therefore he doesn't sorrow, read, and lament. So that is how there is no agitation about what is non-existent internally. Okay, now the Buddha is going to, I would say, he's going to tackle these two So this is the interesting thing. In this passage we have two things. One would be possessions. And so when one doesn't get the possessions, then one becomes upset and miserable. And the other aspect is the view of self. And when one has the view of self, then one, when one hears about the Buddha teaching the Dhamma to eliminate all views of self, then one thinks, I'm going to be annihilated and destroyed, and so one becomes upset. And now the Buddha is going to elaborate on the same point in a somewhat different way, from a different angle. First he speaks about possessions. Maybe we can say this passage is showing the wise attitude to take to these two ideas. One, the idea of possessions, the other is the idea of self. So beginning with possessions, the Buddha says, you may well acquire that possession which is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, and that will endure for eternity. So if there is such a possession that will last forever, the Buddha says, go ahead and get it. So, let's see what I want. Private plane, Prius hybrid, uh, a nice house on the Riviera, another house in Southern Mexico, Mexican coast, what else would be nice to have? Diamond ring. So the Buddha is saying, I can get it. But wait a minute, he's saying that it has to be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. Now, how about my... <laughs> I <know> that's <laughs> <laughs> but of course, the earth won't last forever, the solar system won't last forever, the Milky Way won't last forever. So do you see any such possession? And the monks say, no. So then Buddha says, good, I also don't see anything that will, any possession that will last forever. Okay, so this, here the Buddha is saying that 
from this point of view, you see all possessions as being impermanent, and thus you give them up, or give up the attachment to them. Then, coming to the idea of self, the Buddha says, you may well cling to that doctrine of the self that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who clings to it. But do you see any such doctrine of the self? And then the answer comes, no venerable sir. The Buddha says, I too don't see any such doctrine of the self. Okay, then it seems in the third sentence here, the Buddha is just expanding the range of this more widely, maybe because he's here sort of indirectly or even directly criticizing the monk Arita, who is adopting a view, not explicitly about the self, but it's a kind of distorted view. So the Buddha says, you may well take as a support that view which would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who takes it as a support. See, that's an important qualification. It's sort of leaning on the view, trying to get some kind of security out of that view. Let me just readjust this. Yeah, the Buddha also teaches taking up views, but the Buddha speaks about taking up the right view and then using this not as something that one relies on as a sense of, for a sense of identity or for a feeling of security, but one take, takes up right view in order to use it as a guide. a guide to right understanding, especially the understanding that comes through insight. Okay, so the Buddha says that he doesn't see any support of views that would arouse, that would not arouse sorrow, limitation, pain, grief, and despair in one who takes it as a support. I think probably the implication is this word nisaya, which is translated as support. In fact, one does use right view as a support, but the implication of nisaya, the Pali word, is something that one is dependent on, that one is clinging to or attached to, or is using something as a support. In fact, the Buddha speaks about using right view as a support for crossing the flood, for crossing samsara. But again, it's using it for, as a support the way one uses the raft in order to cross the stream. Again, the Buddha is going to be using or setting against one another these two ideas of self and what belongs to self. So he says, if there were a self, wouldn't there be that which belongs to self? So if I have a self, then I can say these five aggregates are mine. They belong to me. They belong to myself. So, then the Buddha says, if there is what belongs to a self, wouldn't there be for me a self? If I say these five aggregates are really mine, then there must be a true I, a true self that owns or possesses the five aggregates. But then the Buddha says, since a self and what belongs to a self are not 
apprehended, not found, not discovered as things that are true and established. This is very important, the way the Buddha phrases this. He's not saying, since there is no self and nothing that belongs to self, which is like It's a, almost like a metaphysical statement, but he's saying, he gives a kind of empirical, an empirical flavor. He says, since the self and what belongs to a self are not found, not discovered as true and established. In other words, this is a kind of direction, a directive, instruction. Look for a self. Look for something you could say, this belongs to myself. But when we look, when we search, we don't find anything. What we find when we do the search is bodily form, feelings, perceptions, the mental factors or volitions, and the consciousness. And those don't have the qualities of a self. We'll see why in a moment. So the Buddha says when, and he says that these are not found as true and established. In other words, we could use them as conventions. Like I could say this tape recorder is mine, so if you take it, like the woman in Copenhagen did, I told you about, <laughs> then I say she took my tape recorder, and by mistake I took her tape recorder. So we mixed up our respective tape recorders. So she had to send me mine, I had to send her what was really hers. But as true and established, as something that's really mine in an ultimate sense, what's really true, what's really the self in an ultimate sense, not to be apprehended, not to be found. So then this standpoint for views that which is the self is the world and so on. The Buddha says, doesn't this become an utterly and completely foolish teaching? And then the monks say, that is so. Okay, now the Buddha is going to direct the monks into a kind of insight, direct insight into selflessness. And he begins by taking the most evident of the three. Maybe at this point I'll ask whether there's any questions on what has been covered in the above paragraphs. Okay, Richard. It's the floating microphone. Uh, 20, 25. Uh, 25 looks to me like um, Hume's search for himself. He finds it, he doesn't. Hmm. But what he has is a bundle of perceptions. There's no Self. But that seems to mean that the self is not an object of perception. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that it's not the subject of perception. Mm. Right? Um, it seems, that would seem to be the conclusion one might draw, except that the way this is treated in the Buddha's teaching is that that act of observation also has to be, in a way, scrutinized we call this reflexively. And so one sees that that act of observation itself has passed to be followed by the next moment or occasion of observation. So instead of pos positing a lasting and enduring observer behind the observations, all one finds reflexively are acts of observation which have arisen and passed away. So you find a serial observer. Excuse me? A serial observer. Yeah, yeah, I could put it that way. Okay. Any further questions on this? Okay, um, Dina in the back. Oh, man, I'm sorry, this is big. I, I think this is really big. Okay. And Okay. Is, it, is it possible for you to apply this 
to a real person living in the world yeah. that has a job and has a house and has children. And can you help me to understand this? Okay. In I think the text not is not Yeah, anyway, the text is going to go on and show the way that to you say the line of investigation that leads to the insight into non-self. That's going to come in what follows. <coughs> okay, then there comes an internet question. I mean, this gets a little complicated, so I'm just going to skip this question, because I want to try to finish in 10, 15 minutes to finish the sutta. Okay, so let us go into paragraph 26. Here we're going to see it's a kind of reasoning, or lo logical investigation, which is to lead into the understanding of non-self. <coughs> So, non-self is actually the conclusion of a step-by-step -step investigation which begins with what is most evident, most clearest to, say, to an introspection, and that is the mark of impermanence. So the Buddha says, what do you think is material form or body, permanent or impermanent? Okay, it's impermanent. Okay, that is, to say, an established fact of observation. Then comes the question, maybe a little difficult to get the point, is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? We can say is what is impermanent bound up with suffering or maybe subject to displeasure, up to pain, to misery, or is it essentially bound up with happiness, bliss, pleasure? And then the answer comes again and again in the suttas that it's bound up with suffering. It doesn't mean that always the body is subject to suffering. <laughs> I mean, people have blissful and joyful enjoyable experiences through the body, but as long as there's bodily existence, one is subject to suffering. So when we really look closely into the nature of bodily existence, we see that because it's impermanent, whatever strength we have, our health, our vigor, our joys of the body, are subject to change, they don't last. And so the bodily existence is <clears throat> bound up with suffering, and so looked at deeply and clearly, it's, you say it's flawed or defective, unsatisfactory. Okay, now, is what is impermanent, bound up with suffering, and subject to change, subject to deterioration? fit to be regarded thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself, and the answer comes, no venerable sir. Now, I think to understand this point really clearly, what's being driven at here, one has to say maybe something about the Indian understanding of the idea of what we call self, atta, or in Sanskrit, atma. Like, in ordinary English, we use the word self simply to refer to our day-to-day -day identity. But in the Indian culture, the Indian civilization at the time of the Buddha, the quest to find the self meant the quest to find what is permanent, eternal, everlasting. And so once one finds that something is, and that the self is, on the one hand, it's permanent and everlasting, and at the same time, it's a perennial source of bliss. The self is ever blissful, ever 
eternal source of happiness and joy. And so once one finds that something is impermanent and that is subject to suffering, then one sees that it is not to be taken as one's real self, one's real identity. And so then what is impermanent, changing, bound up with suffering, is seen as not mine, not I, not myself. Okay, then the same inquiry is applied to feelings. We have feelings arise, pleasant feelings, painful feelings, neutral feelings, but the feeling arises and passes. It's impermanent. And even the pleasant feelings pass away, and when they pass away, they will be followed by painful feelings. Then perception, we can have pleasant perceptions, but those are impermanent. And every perception is changing. It arises, passes, the next one arises and passes. So we have what we call perception is actually a series of individual perceptions arising, disappearing, changing. Then we have the here called formations, but actually volitional activities. I do this, I want this, I behave in this way, I'm walking, the walking stops, I'm sitting, the sitting stops, I, st I stand up, the standing stops, I sit down, the sitting stops, I lie down. So even the positions of the body are changing and the volitions that determine my pos the volitions that determine what I do with the body, always changing. And then the consciousness, the awareness of all this, is also impermanent. This comes back to that point, maybe that Richard made. Even the awareness, that light of consciousness that illuminates all of the objects, is just a flickering, you could say a flickering of bursts of light which illuminate sometimes a visible form, then a sound, then it can be um, thoughts in my own mind, then again I might turn to something visible. So the consciousness is always changing. And so what is impermanent and changing, bound up with suffering, with painful experiences, this I don't want to identify with, this I can take to be what I truly am. This is not that eternal, that everlasting self. And so the Buddha then says, paragraph 27, any kind of material form, whatever, past, present or future, internal or external, far, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all material forms should be seen as it actually is with correct wisdom. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. And so on for feeling, perception, the volitional activities, and consciousness. So all of this should be seen with correct wisdom. This is not mine, this I am not. This is not myself. So here we come to the very clear, compre all comprehensive insight into the selfless nature of the five aggregates. We've pro proceeded from impermanence to the mark of dukkha, unsatisfactoriness or suffering. Together they point to the mark of non-self, selflessness. Then the Buddha binds it all together by showing that all the five aggregates are not mine, not I, not myself. Then when one sees this, paragraph 28, the well-taught noble disciple becomes disenchanted with form, material form. That is, normally we cherish the illusion or the perception 
this body is mine, I, myself, feelings, perceptions, volitional activities, consciousness, we take them to be mine, I, and self. So those we could say are the illusions that bring this enchantment and clinging and delight in body, feeling, perception, volitions, consciousness. But now as the insight penetrates into the selfless nature of these five aggregates, there comes what is called in Pali, the Bita, disenchantment. Five aggregates are not mine, but this is mine. <coughs> Myself. So this is the beta, which is disenchantment. Disenchantment with the five aggregates. Then paragraph 29, from disenchantment, he becomes dispassionate. So the noun here is viraga. That means the removal or ending of raga. Raga is attachment, craving, lust but not only in the sense of sensual, sensual desire, but it's that desire for, clinging to, um, attachment to the five aggregates. And then through this passion, the mind is liberated. It's liberated from the three outflows, or the leaks of sensual craving, um, craving for continued becoming, continued existence, and the outflow of ignorance. And so when the mind is liberated, there comes the knowledge, it's liberated, and he understands birth is destroyed. That sounds a little strange. I now prefer to translate it, birth is finished. In other words, he's ended the cycle of rebirths. The holy life, the spiritual life has been lived, that is, he's completed the development of the Noble Eightfold Path, or of the three stages of, vir of virtuous conduct, samadhi, concentration, and wisdom. He's done what had to be done, completed the practice, and now there is no more coming back to any state of conditioned existence. So that is the end of the end of the whole process of cultivation. Okay, I thought I would be able to finish the sutta today, but I see we're going to run into a third class on this. So I will end here. If there's any questions that can be answered briefly, we'll answer them now. If not, then just save them for next week or for the discussion period after the class. Okay. Okay, this is a question. Hindu, Brahman, and other religious contemplatives also look for the self, but find it in the union with a creator God. The Buddhas come to a different non-self conclusion by the methodology of looking for the self's non-existence limited within the five aggregates. 
Let me say this for, it gets to be a real big, you said a brief question. It seems to be a very complicated question. So let me save this and try to answer it next, next week. Okay, I'm going to end the class now since I heard the gun for the lunch. Um, then we can continue the discussion after lunch, about 12 noon. And if anybody has other questions that come up, we could take them next week. I will finish the sutta, then we could have more discussion of it. Okay, so we'll end with the sharing of the merits. And I'm going to share a few other things besides merits after the class. So, let us do the recitation. Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Itika Punyanta Anumodipa Shiran Rakantu Sasana Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Itika Punyanta Anumodipa Shiran Rakantu Desana Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyanta Nanumodipa Chiran Rakantu Mamparan Eta Vatacham Hehi Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sabhi Deva Namodantu Sapasapati Siddhya Eta Vatacham Hehi Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sabe Bhutanu Modantu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Eta Vatacham Hehi Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sabe Satanu Modantu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Baba Bhupadhyaya Vichy Hita To Hitantare Satakayu Papana Rupiya Rupicha Sanya Sanino to Kapamu Chantu, Pusantu Nibuti. Okay, so the next class will be next week. That's the April 24th. Again, with the half hour meditation from 9.30 to 10. And then we finish the class from 10.10 10 till 11.30 or so. I wanted to mention that the Guangyan Monastery will be having a kind of Dharma retreat the weekend. This will be April 30th, May 1st, and May 2nd. Starting April 30th, what time? Uh, actually, it's registered April 29th. That's a Thursday? Uh, yes. Okay, so the registration is the evening of April 29th, and then it will take place all day on... Friday, Saturday, and I think the morning on Sunday. Yeah. And then there'll be lectures, classes, myself, and I think Venerable Dhamma Deepa, the abbot, will give talks. There'll be meditations and instruction and in, I think the monastic way of life. So you get to experience a little bit about what it's like to live as a monk or a nun in a monastery. Don't go running out the door, please. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. <laughs> And I said,